three. So we are live again on Syriana Analysis. And today I am with Janice Kortkamp. Janice, thank you very much for being uh, my guest. You are a peace activist and also a citizen journalist. How many times you have been to Syria in the past years? Well, thanks so much for having me on today, Gavor. Um, I've been seven times, seven wow. trips, each lasting about three weeks. And those happened from May 2016 through December 2019. Mm -hmm. Those were tough times when you went there. Just the, the hostilities uh, were still going on uh, back then during this time, especially on the suburbs of Damascus. You have seen a lot in Syria, I would assume. And that's why I wanted to host you today on Syrian Analysis. Let's speak something different today, not much about politics, but rather about the social aspects, the culture, the languages, the religions, women rights in Syria, things that we don't usually discuss nowadays because people prioritize geopolitics, war, etc. But uh, Syria is not only war. There are so many things we can speak of. And uh, I think you're uh, one of the best people who can describe it after your visits and also blogs. You published many articles uh, online that describe life in Syria. So you traveled uh, many times, six times, you already mentioned in the past years, seven, uh, seven uh, to Syria. You traveled more than me to Syria after the war. <laughs> and you met with Syrians from all sides of war, right? First of all, what encouraged you, like, to go to war zone, uh, and what was the mission you set for yourself before going uh, to Syria? Sure. First, I want to make sure people know that I am completely 100% self-funded, 100% unaffiliated, independent. Uh, what I've done about Syria it purely is because I ended up from 5,000 miles away falling in love with the country. It, it, really is the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. And I'm 61 years old, you know, it was, it was a very strange experience. Um, I had started researching Syria and the war at the end of 2012. And um, I had did not know anything about the place or really the conflict at that time. I had kind of believed the narratives that had been spread in the media, etc. Uh, but when I started researching what was going on because after Libya things just didn't seem to be ha adding up and I got suspicious and, and skeptical. Um, I didn't just research what was happening on the ground during the conflict but Syria as a country itself and the more that I found out about the place and the people uh, this I began to really like it you know just to really kind of uh, it just resonated with my soul, I guess, is the way to describe it. And I think uh, what really encouraged me to go was getting to know Syrians online because it it was unprecedented in human history that I, as a housewife in Virginia, could be on my computer <laughs> and literally be asking people in homes in Aleppo and Damascus and all yes. over, you know, what's going on over there? And of course, you know, some people just became friends and they were like, you got to come, come see for yourself. And I read traveler stories of people who had visited and the extraordinary level of hospitality and graciousness that they had received. And I, over the years, it, it was four years of that kind of research. And, and this idea was growing in me that I just really had to go and see because honestly, I thought I was going nuts. Hmm. You know, I'm like seeing this, what something I'm like, I think is going on. And then everybody else is saying this in the media and they just didn't jive at all. And so I felt like for my own sanity, I had to go. What about your family? Weren't they afraid for you to go to, uh, to Syria? We're kind of an odd bunch. No, they were... <laughs> They have been totally a thousand percent supportive, very excited. Um, we talked about the dangers. Of course, it was, as you said, uh, a dangerous place. There were dangerous areas. And I have been to in some hot spots. And um, But we all felt that it was really important that not only did I need to see it, but other people needed to hear another side of the story as well. 
And so, yeah, they, they were totally supportive. I did have one friend and, mm -hmm. and she since become like totally on board with what I've been saying. But before I went, she said, Jan, you cannot go there. They're all going to want to kill you. <laughs> and I, knew by, I knew enough by that time. I said, yeah, by feeding me too much. You know? Yes, and yes, that, that that's so true. You could die in Syria by, by eating so much food. And And for those who don't know, we honor our guests by feeding them. So if we feed you uh, like some extra food, that means we like you. And if you don't accept eating our food or more when we fill your plate, you're disrespecting us. Oh, and I, I have grown up. I have grown up with that also uh, due to, to my mother. And my mother is a very brutal. I would say, in insisting you have to eat. You know, and when guests come, and they're not used for that, and I was like, "Mom, khalas in Arabic we say khalas, like uh, don't push more, right?" And uh, because personally, I also don't like somebody to push more. I get ill when I eat over if, if I'm overfed. But that's the thing in Syria. You have to eat, guys. If you come to Syria, don't reject eating, and you will not uh, like uh, regret because the food in Syria is amazing. But before going to the food, because we're coming to the food later, right? Right. Um, right. Uh, lots of people. Lots of people travel to Syria. Um, whether they're journalists or citizen journalists, or they just want to see what's happening there. And people who, who never visited Syria, they have uh, preconceptions, right? Stereotypes uh, or preconceptions or even misconceptions uh, about Syria. After you traveled to Syria, what were the main uh, misconceptions, stereotypes that turned out to be correct or false about Syria? Actually, you know, I have to say, I think my research was pretty comprehensive and, and it was so helpful because the Syrian people that I was in contact with were very honest and open with me and told me what to expect and prepare for. Um, it was, I was expecting a hospitality culture, but Syrians do it like exponentially more so i think mm -hmm. you know literally people me helping me across the street because i'm a country girl you know i'm not used to being in the city uh stereotypes and misconceptions that syria in my opinion blows away every stereotype that most americans have of the middle east you know and and I was thankful to have done the research that I did. I, I memorized the map. I had learned the industries, the agriculture, you know, as much as I could possibly absorb. Because once you're in there in the war, you're on your own. You know, there's no American embassy, for example, that could help you if you got in trouble. So that kind of thing. So I felt like I really had to be prepared. But I think that if most... Americans, and I would say 99.99% of Americans have no clue about anything of the way Syria is. And, uh, you know, my hope and my dream is for it to be open as it was before the war and for people to be visiting and traveling in there. And I would love to see that happen again. Actually, yesterday I was watching a video. It's from a podcast, but it's, 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 it's a regular thing that it pops up a lot on my social media feed. Uh, people in the United States are being asked about geography, are being asked about <laughs> like name three countries of the, outside the United States, or show me where China is on the map or Ukraine is on the map. Like, is it is it is it really that bad? The 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 I would say the general knowledge out uh, of the Americans of affairs that are far away from the United States, because in Syria, I remember. I mean, when I was in the fifth grade, we learned geography. And I was in the fifth grade, I, I could locate every European and Asian country. Like, we learned it hard, right? And uh, so it, it, it really mind blows me some, sometimes. Is it exaggeration or is the political culture is too poor in the United States? Well, it's a complicated question. You know, yes, it is. Very, the understanding is very poor. And even among people my age, often they're, they may be better off than a younger generation about that stuff because we did learn it probably harder in school but it's pretty hazy to them mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i've had very in-depth discussions with 12 year olds in mm -hmm. syria about politics geography history and things like that 
where that would be very unusual here because it doesn't affect us. And this is the bottom line is we're very insulated by the oceans and Canada. And, you know, we have one border this big and we have no idea what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But yes, in general, I would say the reception, it, it's not that these are stupid people. You know, typically on those videos, you're often seeing people that, you know, don't have a clue about anything. But I'm, but people even who are educated and aware are often very, very weak in these matters. Yesterday, um, um, I, I watched a video someone is asking questions to the people do you support ukraine this was i think in la yeah of course like 99 percent they support ukraine can you locate ukraine on the map like definitely no one can locate ukraine on the map it's like like i thought it's from a parody or from a comic movie right yeah. but yeah. it's not it's real it's real it's real and i think uh, this culture is also expanding the culture of um, black and white culture of uh, simplistic way of understanding uh, complex geopolitical issues. Assad bad, the rest are good. Putin bad, the rest are good. We are good, they're bad, you know? And uh, it is also spreading into other countries and cultures, including in Syria. I mean, in my humble opinion, um, I, can, I can personally debate um, lots of people who are against the government in Syria, and I can do that respectfully with them. Um, but the way they understand the conflict in Syria is very simplistic and it, it shows that um, it's not the mind that is formulating these uh, opinions, it's the uh, it's emotions mostly, uh, they, they base their opinions on emotions. But you traveled to Syria uh, and you know Syria is known to be a mosaic of many ethnicities, races, religions and even religious sects. The, U the UN up until this moment, calls the war in Syria a quote-unquote civil war, which indicates that there is an armed conflict between these components of the Syrian society. How do you personally define uh, the war in Syria after you, you visited there? I always have summarized it as a, and I'll be very blunt here, I summarize it as a U.S.-led terrorist proxy regime change attempt war against Syria. And, uh, you know, there's lots of nuance there. Being on the ground, the fighting forces were two very distinct sides. Okay, you've got the green flag people and the red flag people. Um, in society wise, as you know better than I, it's a very complex society and people have their own opinions and, and there's a wide spectrum of opinion. Um, but knowing now, uh, in my research over these years, how this conflict was literally manufactured, you know, in very typical CIA MI6 style. Um, these are old, old tricks. And, you know, this isn't the first time that uh, someone, you know, some empire has tried to seize Syria. People don't even understand that it's been coveted and fought over since the world's first empires sprang up. So this is, I, I like to say that most of the Syrians I've met and, and talked with there can kind of see an imperial power coming from 5,000 miles away to mess with it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, it's almost like instinctual that they know that this is an outside, uh, externally fomented and, and nurtured kind of conflict. And we know that for a couple of reasons that even if you don't have all the background and the research, never was there a single unifying leader on the revolutionary side, ever. Would you agree with that statement? Of course, and I, I remember very well in 2013, I was in uh, universe, American University of Cairo, and I was debating an opposition figure there. It was televised. And this is one of the questions that I raised, like, who is, who, who is the leader of this revolution? Because I myself, that I am a student of political science back then, and we know for sure that one of the conditions of a revolution for, for it to have a leader, a leadership at least, 
but uh, and they they were saying to me no the leader is the people but the people cannot decide the people can have demands but in order to organize these demands into uh, an hierarchy of demands and have a, an or organizational force in a way you can shape the people or take them to the direction that uh, they have to go for the end game which is to bring democracy human rights and all these cliches to syria right but there wasn't any so um on on the on the let's say the pro government side everybody knows who is the leader and uh, everybody knows that there is um, a reference which is the presidency which is the foreign ministry which is the the defense ministry there are people can talk and communicate with them but the the revolution side for example and when i say revolution always guys quote unquote okay uh, the revolution side uh, some of them are in ankara some of them are in doha some of them are in riyadh some of them are in paris others are here in berlin and i truly do not understand how can there be a revolution and revolutionaries who are outside of the country and they want to make a change inside the country and now when they know that the project has failed so that's why they're insisting on more sanctions and these sanctions are mostly by the way if if these lobbyists the syrian lobbyists they leave the american administration alone i think the americans do not care a lot now about syria but they are the ones insisting and they are networking with um, the lobbies in the united states including the qatari and the uh, israeli lobbies in order to increase the sanctions on on the people because they know the project has failed so they want to strangle the, the economy in syria but by doing so they are strangling the syrian people it's as as basic so in my i the other day i asked this question on twitter if i am syrian and I'm asking the American government, the German government to impose sanctions, more sanctions on Syria. And they're harming the people there. Is this not the definition of treason? Because uh, you, you're not even harming the government there. And in, in, now if you go to Syria and go to any Syrian official, they're not deprived of these needs. <laughs> it's the people suffering from from uh, from this blockade and from this siege and from these sanctions. So if this is not treason, then what is the definition of treason right well i could talk a lot on on that topic the it's very similar to the situation of the cuban expats you know that really are the driving force behind maintaining the blockade and the aggression against cuba same thing we saw with venezuela so this is a very typical and tragic situation uh, it's hard to understand because all of those people must have some family remaining in Syria. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I don't understand that there's such a vendetta mentality, such a vengeance of just making everybody suffer. Of course, Americans, you know, we're talking about Americans who support Ukraine and can't pick it out on a map. And it's very mm -hmm. difficult then to discuss the nuances of these conflicts. But they have no idea what sanctions do. They don't understand that it's literally like a medieval siege around a town that is cutting off Syria from not only from participating in the world economy and being able to import and export and all of those things, but it, it's literally to create a pressure cooker situation there where everything bad gets uh, made worse, you know. Um, criminal behavior, smuggling, you know, all of these things, corruption, of course, get increased, 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 because that is what happens in that kind of pressure cooker situation. And so why would you want that to happen to your homeland? You know, why would you want that to happen to people that you know are still in Syria that have, were never your enemy? I just don't get it. Um, this is a one million question. I have asked it many times. And um, if I ask uh, any of these uh, lobbyists who are pushing here in Berlin, like I've been to demos against the American sanctions. And <laughs> just imagine like the revolution side, they go to demos all the time and we don't go there like facing them and telling them why you're doing this and that. But when we go in front of the American embassy to call for lifting the American sanctions, they come. They are always there. 
and they are bashing us and and calling us names and telling us that we are paid by Assad or like as if Assad has money to pay anyone anyways and they're calling for more sanctions and they're denied that these sanctions are harming the people but you know that the Syrians are very uh, kind and generous and uh, you mentioned the hospitality of the Syrian people. Has this changed in your opinion uh, after the war in Syria due to the acts of hostilities and the deprivation of Syrians from the basic necessi necessities, including food? I think, you know, I started, my last trip was December of 2019, November, December. And I felt like I was starting to see that a little bit even then that, um, you know, up until that point, and still on that trip, people were so warm and welcoming. It didn't matter if I knew them or not, you know, they were always, I just wrote about this on Twitter, the, the exchange would be, where are you from? I'd say, I'm, I, I literally say like, I'm an American. And they would say, oh, you know, Americans, we love Americans. <laughs> We hate your government, but we love the people, you know, and I'd say I hate my government, too. Um, but I think that clearly, you know, after the COVID years and the and then the absolute devastation of the economy, the devastation of the middle class, you know, just everything in shreds like that and people so tired and weary of it all that um, I don't know what it would be like now. I actually the really people are very tired the people are actually very tired now uh, i mean the i think this um it's in their nature to be generous and hospital and stuff but the people are tired and uh, the salaries are 30 dollars per month if you if you check the inflation and uh, the food basket how much you need uh, it's like 100 dollar for um a family uh, and your salary is thirty dollar. So um, I think the the situation in the past two years, economically, financially, and the livelihood has uh, deteriorated, and um, partly because of the Caesar Act. And now they're imposing more sanctions on uh, allegation that uh, Biden administration, with the help of the Syrian lobbyists and the Zionist uh, lobby there, they're imposing more sanctions now on Syria because they say the Syrian government is dealing with drugs. It's like the biggest drug dealer in the world is the CIA. <laughs> it's like if you, if you want to speak about it objectively. And, well, you know, uh, go ahead. And, and uh, dealing with drugs in Syria, I think also uh, it has become a phenomenon after the war. It, 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 there wasn't any before the war, but the chaos and, and the destruction and making the state weak. What do you expect when you weaken a central government? It's, it's, uh, other authorities will rise and other people will have influence. Individuals will have authorities. So I don't understand. You weaken the state. This is the consequence for that. Of course. And, you know, it's also shooting themselves in the foot because these countries have all these Syrian refugees. They're never going to go back home now, but even, you know, most of them probably will never go back, but there was an opportunity. There was a window of opportunity had the sanctions not been in place, had Syria been allowed to rebuild as, as I know Syria could, you know, whenever they've had the opportunity, I've seen, for example, the souk area in Aleppo and in Homs being rebuilt, many neighborhoods being rebuilt. If Syria had been left alone and been able to get international investment and this sort of thing to rebuild their economy without these sanctions, people could have returned. And they're literally making it so there's no economy so that people cannot return. You know, why should somebody go back and make $30 a month when they need $100 to even live in the most basic style? Yep. You know, I, th I think it. this mentality is this mentality that you mentioned is mostly from the pro government side. I mean, they have all the right. Why would you go back on a salary of thirty dollar in Syria? How can you live and survive without these basic necessities? But on the other side, the side of the revolution, they don't want Syria. Like they they don't feel any belonging to Syria anymore. And I have really friends, and colleagues. We were together in the same school, in the same university, and we speak. And they say, I don't care about Syria anymore. I don't want to go back to Syria. Halas, it's like, 
I don't see it even on the map. Who cares what's happening to Syria? I'm here. I have my German passport now. I'm I'm German. I'm happy with that. This is the attitude. And I'm talking with brutal honesty uh, that maybe other people uh, dislike to hear that. It's it's so sad, you know, having been there. Syria, for someone like me as a visitor, is a captivating place. And it really did, you know, I was in Aleppo at an old soap factory and the owner had a glass of water, Aleppo water. And he said, if you drink this, you will return, you know. And so, of <laughs> course, I grabbed the glass and drank. Um, and many of the people that I know there had these, these deep rooted, uh, this deep rooted connection, young people that wanted to go study abroad and then come back and bring that knowledge to improve Syria and, and be involved in exciting projects. All of those dreams have been killed. Yes. And it, it it's, um, to be honest, this year I've just been really down about it because I don't know what to say to people anymore. It, it's utterly heartbreaking. Even if you want to go back to Syria and uh, want to help in the reconstruction or help the country in any ways, it's how can you do that now in these uh, circumstances? If you're going to run after securing a few hours of electricity and fuel for your family to survive during this uh, hard winter, I mean, people are prioritizing survival over reconstruction or any other innovation or <laughs> doing some business. Like really, people are busy in, in to find bread, to find milk for their newborn uh, child. But speaking of food, <laughs> of course, you enjoy the food in Syria, right? Because for me, it's like really, I miss the Syrian food so much that yeah, here in Berlin, I mean, there are Syrian shops as well, but nothing close to the Syrian food. Yeah, you know, uh, what's your favorite? I would have to say Macduz. Macdus is uh, definitely is uh, <laughs> look in, in 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 Aleppo in Aleppo uh, we in the morning for example uh, it's more of a dish of full or fette and then uh, we like meat a lot so during lunchtime is always a, a kebab but it's not the kebab like they do here in 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 the Western countries it's like a donut that kebab no we really barbecue uh, we do some barbecue. Um, uh, there are so many food like dolma or um, it's like a kube in a, in a yogurt and those stuff are precious. I only have a family, a small family here in Germany that if I visit them in a different city that I could enjoy otherwise. Uh, no, it's like in Berlin you have to eat uh, many other types of food, but even the meat in Syria, in my opinion, was different. The way they were growing the animals were different. Uh, here is it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a big industry that they don't care the health of the of the animals. They they we don't know how they slaughter the animal, and these things are being taken care of in Syria. And most of the time, the cows and the sheep are free, they can eat from the grass, they can walk, they can enjoy. It's not like in a company uh, living in, in a one meter square meter place. It, 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 I'm serious, these things change the quality of the food, right? And I, yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Um, the only thing uh, that is truly uh, missing in my life at the moment is the Food, just I would like to say. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a it's a beautiful, fertile, uh, fruitful place, and the produce. If you're just walking around the towns and seeing the produce sellers, and those potatoes, you know, mm -hmm. I don't eat French fries in the United States. They they do nothing for me. But those potatoes, and then they double fry those French fries, and they're just like perfect. Um, the wild pomegranates, the grapes, all of the citrus in Latakia, the, you know, these beautiful, there you go, the spread, the breakfast, um, the fool, like you mentioned, but, but the, the, the agriculture there, and I hear exactly what you're saying. I've always described Syria as like the most real place I've ever been. And I've been in the South of France and in countryside in Italy and things like that. But there is a, um, a special care that is given to the raising of food and the preparation of food. And you can really taste that in every bite. The only dish 
I do not ever need to try again as sheep's testicles. I have done that. I have eaten that. It's <laughs> delicious, I can assure you. And one of my friends, I remember this in 2009. I remember it like today. We were in a restaurant and we like we plotted against him. And he's a, he's a guy that he doesn't like to eat such stuff. He doesn't like to eat a tongue or a brain. We, in Syria, we eat everything, right? They even fill the guts of the, of the animal. They clean it and they fill it with rice and they eat it. So he didn't know that this is a testicle. And we told him this is a chicken, uh, chicken meat. And he ate it and he, he was very happy about it. And at the end of the night, we told him it was a testicle. <laughs> Yes, I was eating it. Everybody was laughing, and that's the signal, you know. You know yeah. what am I eating here? Um, I didn't. That wasn't really my my cup of tea, but I'm glad I tried it anyway. And you're really torturing me right now with these pictures, <laughs> guys. I'm sorry if there is anyone vegan among you, but we don't have yeah. vegan food in Syria. It's like very little, and most of them are with meat. I tell you, what like what we were talking about. We, I went to Slunfo once, mm -hmm. and this beautiful village in the countryside of Latakia in the in the hills and there was this family on the side of the road that had one of the classic uh, clay ovens and they're making the fresh bread and they served it with this like honey butter of, of local honey and I've been trying to describe this honey to people ever since it, literally it was ambrosia it was like okay the, if there is a food of the gods in this world this is it you know I, and i just i don't have the vocabulary to really describe it but i'll never ever forget the taste of that uh, bread and the the one that you ate how is it made is it um, uh, um a honey and what exactly i want to check on the internet uh they, they my friend said it was honey butter Honey butter, yeah, it's ishta, it's it's called ishta basal in in Arabic. I will check it now, uh, uh, because um, I have I also like that a lot. And you, I don't even have the vocabulary here to ishta basal, okay, to explain to the people what does that re really uh, is about. And I'm not sure if this is uh, what we're ishta basal. Let's see, no. Yeah, it, it comes like a creamy, white creamy with kilo uh, Yeah, it's it, it's like a cream over with the honey, right? That's what it tasted like. You know, I, it had been the end of a long day. We'd gone up to Kesub and had gone to Saladin's Castle and the you know the shoreline and stuff. So I was kind of like tired, but all I know is whatever they put in front of me was <laughs> was delicious. <laughs> So, this is in terms of food, but if we move to the society in Syria, I mean, Syria is more or less patriarchy, right? Can you describe the status of women in the Syrian society, in this patriarchal um, society? Can we handle the issue as one block, or does it differ from one region to another, or from one community to another? Sure. Well, you know, uh, there are great freedoms and opportunities for women in Syria. And prior to the war, I think there were actually more women attending university even than the men, I believe. Um, I've met women at the very top levels of government. I've met women who are scientists, professors, business owners. Uh, you know, few people know that they can as far as the government is concerned and the laws are concerned, they can wear teeth tank tops and short shorts, you know, that is not dictated by the government. At the same time, it generally is a more traditional conservative culture. And oftentimes it's my impression that really it's the, the patriarch of the family that uh, kind of has the final say or in most families would be my um, impression. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's really a mix. And as you said, you cannot apply a single brush um, a color to Syria. And this is one of the fascinating things about the country is um, a mosaic or, or, or tapestry really is the best way of describing how you have all these cultures and um, you even have the very modern culture. I've had people telling me, you know, it's teaching me about death metal in Norway. And then you have, you know, a very traditional 
part as well. And and they all, even during the war when I was there, they all blended really amazingly beautifully. Um, so no, you can't paint it with a, with one brush. Um, some women are in very, very conservative families, you know, and they dress very conservatively and, and, and they have what a Westerner would say limited rights. Um, and then others are, you know, dancers and physicists. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just a real mix there. Actually, and I, I would but say but when you mean the dress code, like uh, the ones that are more conservative, uh, like wearing more, like covering their faces, right? Like covering their body and stuff. Covering the face is very unusual, except I think in, in many areas in Idlib now, and of course in areas under control of ISIS, but uh, they, the government actually had, I think, made it illegal for women in university to have their faces covered. Hmm. You had to at least have your face open. Yes, you can't. Uh, and by the way, uh, you can't cover your face and teach in Syrian schools. And this is an information I would like to um, uh, mention, uh, guys. The first organized anti-government protest erupted in um, a coastal site in Syria, in uh, Jebli. And uh, there, uh, it was in Jebli, I, I'm not 100% sure, but it was in the coastal area. And the first uh, anti-government protest was um, organized by uh, um, a religious figure called uh, Ayrut, Sheikh Al-Ayrut. And when they went to um, the government buildings and occupied it, first demand, the first demand in their 10 points of demands where they want the uh, women who cover their faces to come back and teach in school, to be allowed to uh, teach in school, and two, to segregate the boys and the girls from the schools. They don't want mixed gender schools. This, these were the first two demands of the liberal, democratic, freedom-loving, the democratic... The moderate uh, rebels, yeah. Moderate rebels. These were the two. And, you know, this is uh, another point that I think is important to bring up. In my research about Syria before the war, what I had read was they were actually investing about 16 to 17 percent of GDP into education and had achieved at least a high 80s level percentage of literacy. Um, many excellent universities and schools, uh, dedicated teachers and education. You know, teachers are highly respected there um, in the society, right? Is, is that fair to say? Actually, uh, the vice president of Syria, she's a woman. And uh, during my university days, most of the professors were women. And they were really, really well-educated, badass women, believe me. <laughs> it's like a woman, an iron fist woman. I remember the dean of my faculty, she was uh, a woman. Uh, her name is Amal Yazaji. And she was later part of the committee to redraft the Syrian constitution, uh, to rewrite uh, several laws in Syria. I mean, I remember when I was 20, 21, like we were afraid of her. <laughs> it's like she was the iron lady. And um, recently she uh, contacted me after I got married and she was congratulating me. And I, I used to like really treat her like a mother, uh, mother figure. And I think in Syria, um, people have the opportunity, whether they're women or men, they have the opportunity. There is the freedom of opportunity for everyone. You want to be educated, you want to be a university professor, you want to be in the business, you want to be uh, whatever you want. As a woman or a man, you have the opportunity to do that. The pressure may come from uh, the family or the society, but not from the government or from the laws. The laws are loose. And, uh, and, and in the contrary, there is more encouragement for women to be in public affairs uh, after Bashar came to power. And that's thanks to the wife, the first lady, who is a very open-minded and liberal uh, woman. And she wanted to bring uh, more women into the uh, the life, the public life, into entrepreneurship, uh, uh, into innovation. So there is a special care for this case, uh, in my opinion, after uh, 20 2001, uh, at least when Asma al-Assad, she formed her office in Syria and she started working to empower 
um, certain segments of the society, the poor, the people in needy, and especially women. I think also Busaina Shaban is as a advisor for the president. She also plays uh, a good role in the past uh, at several decades. She was the personal translator of Hafez al Assad. So I don't think women and a, and a highly recommend, a highly respected and a recognized leader for women's rights in in the Arab world. I think the status of women uh, in Syria before the war was uh, uh, very way better than uh, neighboring countries. And uh, sorry, guys, if there is any Lebanese, and I know that they think like they're more free than in Syria, but it, it, the real the real empowerment for women was uh, in in uh, in Syria itself, and it it was happening gradually on a social level, uh, class level, which is empowering them also financially to become more into the middle class and not be dependent only on their husbands and uh, or brother or family etc. So. This is what I always say, whether man or woman in Syria, you have you had the chance to pursue your dreams. But if uh, in and, and I know this because my brother studied in public university and he has become a very successful engineer. And I know from my friends who have become very successful doctors, surgeons now in Germany and they graduated from Syria. So everybody had his own share. Maybe some people were uh, victim of their families. Their families didn't let them to go to continue studies or be in internship or work in a certain business. And they remained a little bit back financially or intellectually. And, and such things happened. Lots of people also become victims, right? But there was no state policy of uh, oppressing people and not letting them uh, become successful or uh, uh, chase their dreams. Yes, and you know, another point of uh, particularly about women is many women described how they could be walking around their town or city at two o'clock in the morning and be totally safe. And here I am, I'm, I go to Syria on my own. I, oftentimes I would just walk around Damascus, literally trying to get lost because it's a wonderful place to get lost in the old city, you know, wandering around and felt no, this was during the war, I felt no fear of my personal safety, which was, it sounds kind of strange and anti-logical, uh, but it, um, you know, that there is a certain amount of freedom and human rights of safety, of people living in safety. and. And the U, I think it was the UN or Gallup polls had put Syria as in the top five. It was the seventh safest uh, country in the world before the war. Yes, and that. Why is that not valued? I mean, so, so it's say, if any any rational person uh, should prioritize safety and security uh, and food and medicine education and all this stuff above other things um the democracy that they say it doesn't feed people really it really doesn't and it's not the only uh govern rule like ruling system that can make can develop a country no that's not the case sorry there's so many developed countries around the world that aren't copying the liberal democratic systems in the western countries and those people have different cultural background different history and they're advancing and <laughs> they, they often are the us and uk's greatest <laughs> allies you know if you look at i always say saudi arabia versus syria and i don't care if you're if you're comparing democratic structures imperfect but there uh, human rights and personal freedoms, Saudi Arabia is like been in the Middle Ages and, and Syria has been, you know, hundreds of years ahead, if not more. And yet, of course, Saudi can do anything they want and we're our partners in this proxy war against Syria and nobody complains about that form of government. You know, so it, I think one of the biggest clues for anyone, even if they do not understand or can't take the time to research is the total absolute hypocrisy in these policies and what countries are targeted and this and that and the rhetoric about it 
Now, so Syria was developed on so many aspects, but also it had uh, it is considered the cradle of civilization and at the same time uh, home for the biggest Christian community in the region. Now, you as a Christian, what has impressed or surprised you the most about the Christian community in Syria? You know, some people, I, I am Christian I'm, and and uh, I try to be a, a decent one, you know. Some people here have asked me if I went to Syria on a mission trip, you know, to, to teach Syrians about Christianity. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you don't understand. That was the first Christian country in basically in the world. Um, we are dealing with people there that have faced um, massacres, um, you know, being targeted for total destruction, places like Malula, you know, so many, Maharda, all these, uh, there's some beautiful Malula. And so these people have had their faith tested in the extreme as many others have, you know, Muslim and Christian there in Syria. Um, I think what surprised me most was the generosity of spirit, uh, the fearlessness, I, you know, uh, the, oh, what's the, I love the area between Homs and Tartus, you know, all those valleys and the little villages and stuff. And, and in some of those Christian villages, some of the festivals where they're having these wonderful parades and costumes down their streets uh, on feast days or the Christmas celebrations that happen all around the country. Y you know, again, I had done a, a lot of research, so it wasn't surprising to me, but being there during, often I was there during Easter or, or Easter week or what have you, and just seeing this um, steadfast, courageous resilience it was really humbling, you know, mm -hmm. to to see that. And again, it I, I think as a Christian, one of the things that first attracted me to Syria was seeing the strength and, and the vibrancy of the Christian community there. But really, Syrians have taught me a lot. Um, you know, and many of got most of my dearest brothers and sisters in this world now are, are Muslims and and you know it what am I trying to say? <laughs> I think I, I, learned, I learned so much from them. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's a, it's 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 emotional, you know, the situation in Syria among these different cultures and different uh, communities. But we have also still small Jewish uh, community in Syria. What would you say about that? And guys, now I will play a video, uh, which is a Jewish house in Damascus. Um, it's called Beit Farhi. I will play it uh, for you so you can also see the um, what type of uh, home I am uh, speaking about. I will just put it on the screen. So uh, we have a Jewish community in Syria and recently uh, some of the Jewish people uh, or the Jew Syrian Jews who live in the United States, they returned to Syria to visit and they ha had a big group of uh, Syrians and I spoke with uh, one of them, her, her, his name is Joseph Jajati, and he was uh, on Syrian Analysis. Guys, if you want to watch uh, the video, you can search in Syrian Analysis, uh, Jews of Syria or Jewish, just uh, type and watch the, my interview. And I was uh, really happy to see how patriotic uh, person uh, Joseph is and how much he loves the country, how much he loved Syria. It was like everything my grandfather told me about Syria turned to be true. So, so <laughs> and then all these mainstream media outlets are talking about oh my god these jewish americans or syrian jews are going back to syria are they supporting assad what are they doing now in syria you know they have to investigate right, it's like, right. it's guys darker. it's their home it's their home you repeated the lie that the Jews are persecuted in Syria or elsewhere, and you believe the lie, and now you're questioning, what are they doing there? It's like, aren't they in danger? Are they probably supporters of Assad? It's like really ridiculous. They were just there to visit their country. 
and and that was really exciting and that had happened before i think in 2007 2008 and the grand mufti met them at the airport and you know they they toured around often in the old city and of damascus i i just rent a very simple room from a friend of mine whose house is in the old jewish quarter and uh so there were you know a, a pair of elderly jewish sisters who would come and visit in the court courtyard and and my friend who's a sunni muslim he's the one who bought their house for them and takes care of them the christian uh, churches in the area help them with a lot of their food and and needs and things like that uh, the shia temple the, were giving them all their medical care. And what was interesting is uh, that part of Old Damascus is next to a Shia neighborhood, and it was protected by mostly Hezbollah soldiers. And so, you know, you have the Jewish neighborhood protected by the Hezbollah guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one time, I used to, I have brought small tour groups in, you know, organize these small tours that are there with me for like a week out of each of my trips. And so I had the group and we were just walking around the streets there in that area. And there were, there comes the, the rabbi and his wife, his elderly couple walking down the street and all these people are running up to them and giving them hugs and they're waving to the soldiers and I, you know, our group went up there and we're talking to them and they said they never wanted to leave. They, they didn't want to ever leave Syria. I don't know if they're still there. That was probably 2018. Um, but just delightful and such a picture of the best of Syria, you know, is, is that coming together of people um, and especially, you know, the Jewish population had dwindled down to almost nothing. Um, but it's something that has long been a project of President Assad. In fact, before the war, I think he was working to really restore like 10 synagogues there and trying to get the, the Jewish families back. And many of the Jewish homes are kept in perpetuity for their return by the government. It's, it's my understanding it can't be sold or anything, that they're just kept um, so that should some of those families return, they would have their homes again. Actually, one of the synagogues in uh, was in Duma. Yes. And after the war, do you know what the Jewish Islam or Islam's army did? They took all the artifacts uh, from the synagogue and they sold it to Israel. Yes. Um, yes. By the way, guys, this is the picture uh, from this from a synagogue in Damascus, and this is Joseph Jajati that I told you he was my guest on Syrian analysis, and this is the article from the Israeli uh, Times of Israel, and they how did New Yorkers end up vacationing in Syria? It's like <laughs> how dare you go to Syria? You know, it's like what kind of reporting is that? How did they end up in Syria? It's like did somebody parachuted them over Syria? It's like their country, yeah. right? <laughs> like, yeah, but... yeah, I, I was just debating with some guy on Twitter. Uh, he's saying, but you know, Palestine or, or Israel is my homeland, and I said, no, you live in Colorado. Mm -hmm. You know, but here we have Syrian Jews who their homeland is Syria, and they're questioned as to why they're returning. Yeah, and speaking about the Jewish community, how do ordinary Syrians and especially the Christians and the Jews of Syria perceive um, the Israeli policies in the region and particularly towards Syria, like bombing Syria all the time? That was, you know, up until 2012, I didn't know anything about Palestine or that situation, really. I thought I had some understanding, but, you know, people don't, People over there don't understand that in America, Zionism is like fluoride in the water. It's just support for Israel is a given. You know, you don't even question it. You don't. Up until the advent of really widespread social media, I think a lot of people just had no clue, and I was one of them. So as I was researching Syria, I knew that I had to research Palestine and the situation there too. And I give you that background because it is was such a huge learning curve to separate out um zionism and israel from jews and 
you know, the so-called Judeo-Christian tradition and things like that. Um, so it was so refreshing to be in Syria where that Zionist fluoride was not in the water, if you know what I'm, if I'm explaining that properly, where people um, were openly talking about the uh, devastating consequences of the existence and the policies and actions of the Israeli government, um, the expansionism, you know, the uh, the taking over of the Golan, you know, all of these things. Um, and of course, we know that the Israelis have been helping, you know, these armed groups, these terrorist groups to uh, attack Syrian people. So the, I, 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 what I'm trying to say is uh, I, I did not get a chance to talk about to any Jews in Syria about this, although as I said, the rabbi and his wife clearly wanted to stay in Damascus and not live in Israel, you know. Um, but the Christians there were very clear um, and, and quite blunt with me about how devastating it is for American Christians to be supporting Israel like they do and not having a clue what that really does um, in the region, you know, how, how destructive it's been. I think from my personal experience uh, now, especially in Western countries, in my opinion, uh, the political elites here and the media and those who are behind the media, they hate the Christian, Middle Eastern Christians who hold these opinions. They hate them more than the Muslims because for them, they want to simplify this issue as Muslims against the Jews, which is not, right? Like they, so it's, it's an Islamic against a Jewish war, on which side are you going to stand? So most of the Westerners are going to stand with the Jewish people and the history plays are all here. But if you're coming from a Christian background and you say, guys, what are you talking about? Uh, in Syria, we have a Jewish community and our war is not religious in, or the conflict is not religious against Israel. Israel declares itself as a Jewish state, <laughs> but, but Syria is not. Syria is not. Syria is not an Islamic state or a Christian state. It's a mosaic. So, um, when Israel pursues such policies, it affects all of us, including the Christians. And oh, the dogo is trying to have an attention, <laughs> and 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 Iraq, who who. The main perpetrator of the war in Iraq, in my opinion, was Israel. Israel was the one who lobbied uh, for lobbied the United, against the United States, Britain to launch this war. And what happened to the 1.3 million uh, Christians in Iraq? How many of them left? 150,000 Christians now left in Iraq. Why? And the audacity of the American ambassador in in Iraq the other day congratulating the Christians for uh, in 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 during Christmas time and saying that the strength of Iraq in its multi polar multiculturalism and having uh, uh, multi um, religious societies like um, I sometimes I forget like. Aren't you the ambassador of the country which like forced 1.2 million people of a uh, million Christians to leave Iraq, right? So, uh, of course, in my opinion, um, Israeli policies uh, negatively um, affects uh, all the Christians in, in the region. And uh, if we see the strategic interests of Israel, I think it, it is in the interest of Israel to have uh, one color states in the region. Uh, and to empty the societies from its multiculturalism and and uh, because Israel says I want to be just a state just for the Jews so if the neighboring countries are also uh, ethnocentric or religious centric uh, countries then where is the problem for Israel to become a state just for the Jews right I think that's a I think that's a factor. I also think it's a factor, and I actually haven't heard people talking about this too much, but I think it is important, is that Israel cannot afford to have a secular, stable, successful, women-empowering Arab country next door to it. You know, because it's similar to like what you were saying, if 
if the region is Israel versus, you know, the monsters, if it's Israel versus extremists, if it's Israel, the perception is they, I think they could then get away with doing anything they wanted even more than they do now. So if you can arrange for Syria to be taken over by extremists and violent radicals and, you know, then that gives you even a freer reign to do the expansion, to finalize, you know, taking over the Golan and all these things. Uh, I, I truly believe that's a main factor. I truly believe that. And um, I think um, uh, for the Christians uh, in the Middle East, if they really want to uh, keep their roots, they have to resist such uh, projects uh, by NATO and by the United States in the region because uh, they will be uh, dispersed, they will be displaced, they will go to Western countries uh, as refugees and they will not find themselves, uh, uh, they will lose their route, they will lose their geography, they will lose their uh, the place where their ancestors, it's like Christianity didn't come from Europe, right? It came from uh, Palestine, it came from the Middle East. But I would like to end up this uh, conversation with you with last question, which is, uh, I think, very important. Lots of Christians in Syria say, were it not for the Syrian army, Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, uh, the Christians would have been wiped out from the country. How accurate do you think this uh, allegation? Well, it's it's in my opinion, it's hugely accurate. And we have, you know, I've been to Malula four times. And had it not been for the Hezbollah fighters there, where would Malula be now? You know, would, would there be anybody that could have returned there? Um, many of the early battles, of course, uh, targeting Christian communities. Um, and even in Aleppo was huge of the... Um, uh, Reverend uh, Ibrahim Nasser in Aleppo. You know, his Aleppo Evangelical Bible College was blown up by these moderate rebels uh, back in 2012. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it took the combined efforts of the Syrian army, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah to drive out and, and, liberate Aleppo from all of those groups that had committed such atrocities throughout, throughout the years they were holding siege to, you know, at least half the city or more. Um, and, you know, he, uh, Reverend Nasser, actually paid tribute to General Soleimani when General Soleimani was killed and credited him with a, a great deal for saving the Christians in Aleppo. So it, it's one of those situations where, you know, night is day and black is white in the U.S. and Western media about what has really gone on there. And that was one of the biggest and most obvious factors. You know, this happened again and again and again and again. And yet uh, those allies of, of Syria never got any credit <laughs> whatsoever for their efforts to save people from ISIS and Al Qaeda and, and, you know, all the rest. And this is what should really have, you know, much of the reporting about the Syrian war has been criminally bad, deliberately criminally bad. And I think people should be held accountable, accountable for it. Honestly. I will play uh, a very short video. It's like uh, one and a half uh, minute of uh, the Syria Catholic Bishop in Syria, John Obatah. Uh, he gave an exclusive interview to Syrian analysis. Guys, if you want to watch the entire interview, uh, we'll probably post it now in the uh, live chat for you for later to see. Uh, but he spoke exclusively to Syrian analysis and he said, were it not for the Syrian army, and Russia and the allies, uh, we would have been slaughtered now. And this triggered a lot of bad, I would say, uh, reactions from the anti-Syria camp because um, Jano is speaking from a position of authority, is speaking of a position of religious authority, and at the same time, uh, he's um, 
um, having uh, lots of relations in the government and outside the government in the Syrian society. And he stayed there in Syria during the war, protecting his uh, people there, right? And I will just play this one and a half minute for the people to see. And if you guys want to watch uh, on Syrian analysis, you can search for the title Syriac Catholic Bishop and you will find it anyways. But uh, I will play just a small uh, part of it for you to see. It's in Arabic, but there are subtitles. I'm sure you can... Uh, you can probably see. If you can't, let me know. I can post it again uh, this video later. Let's watch it together. زمنا بسياسة الغلط تبع أمريكا والضعف الموقف الأوروبي. أوروبا ضعيفة. أوروبا ما عندها قرار. بس القيم تبعها إذا بتستعملها أوروبا تستعمل سلطة وقوتها. نحن لولا روسيا كنا تذبحنا. أنا أهلي كانوا تذبحوا لولا روسيا. إيد الله اللي بعتت روسيا. لأنه ما في بديل أنت إذا بتختاري بين الأسد والغاب لأن نختار الأسد لأنه بالغابة بجوز يطلع لك فيل بجوز يطلع لك ديناصور شو هالثقافة اللي جايبين إياها هي ثقافة داعش إلغاء الآخر قطع الرؤوس ما شفتون على التلفزيون كيف عم يقطع رؤوس البشر لأنه مختلف هذا هو الدين هذا هذا ما له علاقة بالإسلام هذا ما له علاقه بالاسلام، هذا اعتبار منظمه سياسيه إلى اهداف مبعوثه من برا. نحن عايشين بسلام، بسوريا ما في حرب اهليه، نحن بنحب بعضنا، نحن بنعيش مع بعضنا، نحن ما بنعرف اصلا المسلم من المسيحي. بالنسبه للغرب بيصوروا هو الموضوع اساس انه هي حرب اهليه باعلامهم. لا لا الأربي. لا نحن استقبلنا اهالي المسلحين وساعدناهم بالشام اهالي المسلحين I think this uh, part that it was very, very important, uh, in my opinion, what John Obata said, and a lot of people would not really know and appreciate what he said. And similarly, like they don't appreciate what you say because uh, you guys were in Syria and you saw with your own eyes and you reported uh, objectively what you have seen. Janice, if you're having. That was a powerful statement. Yeah. I've seen yeah. that before when you did it before. and. Um, I would and have put my life at, a, at on this at the stake to say that is exactly what happened. Yeah, and uh, he puts himself in jeopardy because you know even in the Vatican uh, there is politics there, and he would have uh, uh, lost his position, his uh, because there are also ranks in in in, in the bishop, right? And uh, but uh, he took a position, he stayed on it, and he defended his community, and I salute him. For that, similarly, like I salute you for speaking the truth, because for me, it's very important for the people to have a comprehensive uh, understanding of what's happening in Syria. And that's why Syriana Analysis is there, uh, because uh, I feel like it's a mission for me to open the eyes of the people. And thanks to you and thanks to other independent journalists who are underground in Syria, I think, I think we have done a good job. And uh, we're, we're have, if we haven't done a good job, they wouldn't have hate, hated us so much with passion. This is just my simple, simple analysis for the situation. I mean, if we haven't done any difference, they, why wouldn't even there? Why wouldn't uh, would they even hate us or write about us or do this and that? So I think we have done a good job. Thank you so much, Janice, for being my uh, guest uh, today on Syriana Analysis. It was really a pleasure to have you and share your insights with the, the audience of Syriana Analysis. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate all the work that you do, and I hope you can just keep up, at, keep at it, and keep growing your audience. Thank you, people. I am actually, I'm always motivated to create content for Syriana Analysis, but were it not for the people who follow Syriana Analysis and uh, like support morally uh, with one comment, seriously, sometimes I receive just one comment, a young boy, 18, 19 years old, telling me that uh, you're my idol, I want to become like you, I want to share the truth and stuff. Those are really motivation for me. And at the same time, 
I'm also independent and uh, I get all my funding for Syrian analysis from the people. They are the ones who do uh, uh, send to Patreon, PayPal, premium membership and stuff. Thank you so much, guys. Really, I really appreciate uh, all your support. And if you want to follow uh, Janice's work, I will put her uh, uh, Twitter account in the description below. Please go hit a follow for her and find a ways also to support her for her next trips. And see you next time.